Hey, it's John, and it's time for the Jmart cast for Monday, May 9th. What's going on, friends and family? How are you? Thank you for joining me for another episode. Hope you've had a great week. Mine has been much better than the previous. Just as a recap, last week I got sick with COVID and had finally gotten over it on Sunday. And then this week, still sounding a little bit stuffy, but feeling much better. And I've had a way better week. Um, first of all, <laughs> thanks to all the friends who uh, reached out. There's a couple of people who reached out from the last episode and said they were glad that I was doing better and was recovering from from COVID. So appreciate you all for reaching out. And then uh, one of the funny things that happened was I had a conversation with a buddy who <laughs> was, uh, I guess, during the episode, I made a joke about uh, horse paste medicine. Right. I was talking about ivermectin and how I had like taken some as part of my, uh, you know, early treatment uh, protocol that I developed for myself. And so my buddy was <laughs> after he reached out to um, say uh, he's glad that I'm feeling better. He went on to say that he knows a friend who tried it and didn't get better. And he had uh, pneumonia or something. Let's see what he say. He d didn't help him at all. And then four weeks and pneumonia is what he writes. All good now. LOL. So <laughs> that was quite shocking to <laughs> get like something like that. I'm like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. I'm su surprised that it would be like that. You know, for most people, it's like either, either helps or it doesn't hurt things. It doesn't seem to make things worse. worse. So four weeks of feeling ill and having pneumonia doesn't sound very good. So I hope i glad he's doing better. But so my response was to ask my buddy if he knew the dose that this guy was taking. I asked if he knew that by any chance. And then his response was that he dosed himself as a 90 kilogram pony. <laughs> and that's when like the wheels, the gears started turning in my head. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, so as a joke, I just wrote, like, was it a suppository? <laughs> and his response was, no, it was liquid. And so at that point, I was like, all right, for sure, this is not a human formulation. And so I asked, I was like, is this can't this can't be a human formulation, is it? And of course, it. he says, no, this is the horse stuff. <laughs> so, you know, somebody out there, it turns out, did actually go and get ivermectin meant for horses to medicate with and you know what i don't blame that person for going out to do that what i do blame is the medical system that basically would uh, ostracize doctors who would prescribe ivermectin as a way of treating people against covid and kind of resulting in them not doing that and then driving people like this person to go and get you know horse medicine when really they should have easy access to the human medicine, the human formulation, because obviously that's the doctor's right to be able to prescribe medicine that they think is going to help their patient. A third party should not have the right to be able to say, oh, you, you shouldn't do that. You, you're not allowed to do that. You're, you will lose your medical license if you, if you do so. There should never be a force in effect like that. It should just be between the patient and the doctor and whatever the doctor thinks is best. But so anyway, moving on, I went to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu this week once on Wednesday. And I was like, you know, I thought I was feeling well post-COVID and didn't really feel symptomatic or anything, wasn't coughing or sneezing. So it seemed like it'd be safe to go and do some jujitsu. So I went to class and just before I tell you what had happened at, at class, it was both my wife and I got sick and I was one day ahead of her. So uh, my symptoms had subsided and then hers were subsiding on the last day. But then she complained to me that as the, the last of the symptoms were going away, she was starting to develop some diarrhea. And I was like, oh, I didn't that didn't happen to me. That just happened to you. And as a bit of a jerk, I kind of made fun of her a little bit for, you know, experiencing diarrhea. And then lo and behold, karma got me back in a quick fashion because 
later on Wednesday, I went to jujitsu and had a little <laughs> bout of diarrhea in the middle of class. And the worst part is I, is I didn't even realize that it happened <laughs> because as we're rolling at some point, my partner who was actually a female, she, which is like 10 times more, more embarrassing. She, she says to me, uh, I think you need to change your pants. <laughs> I was like, what? I was so surprised. I was like, oh no, do I smell really bad? I'm so sorry. And then she's like, just, just go check your pants. <laughs> so, oh man, luckily, like I always have a change of clothes and everything and they have a uh, showers and at the gym. So I went in there and, uh, basically got undressed and cleaned up everything. Luckily it wasn't as bad as it could have been, you know, <laughs> I did have a little wet stain around kind of my bottom area, let's say, but it wasn't brown. So like that was that I feel like that's really, really good. The brown was contained in the in inner layers, <laughs> if you get my drift. <laughs> and it wasn't very much. I can't believe like that happened and I didn't even realize that it was <laughs> happening. <laughs> that's just ridiculous. And then so like, of course, like I my all my uniform was dirty. I needed I changed into my second pair of clothing. So I was going to leave. And so as I'm leaving, the I want to kind of not make a scene and kind of quietly go home. And then just before I'm able to do that, the professor kind of calls me out and says, Hey, John, come back. Don't go yet. Where's your belt? So I'm like, Oh no. So I grab my belt. I give it to him and he calls me on to go to the mat. So I have to go onto the mat and face the person, my old partner who told me to go change my pants. So I have to go and face her. And then of course I, I thank her for telling me <laughs> she's, of course she apologizes to me as most people would. And then I'm like, don't apologize, please. I have to apologize to you. <laughs> anyway. So as that's happening, all of a sudden I realize my professor is giving me a stripe on my belt. <laughs> so on the day that I basically shit my pants in jiu-jitsu class, I got a stripe, uh, my first advancement from a white belt beginner to now a white belt with a stripe. So that's my jiu-jitsu story for the week. <laughs> and then after that, I left. I didn't finish the class. There was still another like 20 minutes left plus rolling. So I left early. I was biking that day. So I biked home and then on the way home because I didn't, stay in class all the way on the way there's a calisthenics park that I stopped at and the little short workout there just to um kind of supplement I guess the uh jujitsu class which I didn't get to fully exert myself on and then as I was working out kind of a funny thing happened where I overheard this uh older lady walking by talking on her phone and she was uh sounding really worried as she was speaking on the phone and she had a mask on and I overheard her saying on the phone to the person who she was talking to, apologizing about how possibly the person wouldn't be able to make out what she's saying because she's wearing a mask. And she was also just saying how she basically tagged that with saying how she wears it all the time now because, you know, everyone's dropping like flies. <laughs> And then th that line kind of just really struck me. Everyone's dropping like flies. I wonder what she meant. Like, I don't think she means like people are dying, like, right? Because I don't think I've seen numbers saying that people are dropping like flies, meaning they're dying all, all over the place because of COVID. I don't know. I'm, I don't watch the news. Maybe that's what the news that she's watching. But that was kind of very interesting to hear that people saying that kind of stuff. Kind of crazy to me. And then the other thing we did this week was go to High Park to see the cherry blossoms blooming. And they were actually so beautiful. It was a lot of fun. We went on, actually, I went on two days. I went both on Thursday and Friday. Friday. On Thursday, I went with my wife and kids. And we drove there and we did the cherry blossoms. We did the animals as well. We went to the zoo and that was like the most that my sons had fun actually seeing the animals in the zoo before he wouldn't be as engaged, but now he seems way more interested in it. So that was kind of really fun actually. And then, holy crap, speaking of inflation, the we went in line to buy an ice cream cone and it was six bucks for like a regular ice cream cone. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> 
I don't know, like six bucks. I feel like it used to be like three bucks. You could get two. <laughs> Uh, but whatever, yeah, whatever. It's like once we were in line, we were committed. I was like, oh, yeah, we're definitely getting this. And then the following day on Friday, I went without my wife, with just the kids and I taking the subway to High Park. And that was an adventure and a half. Uh, <laughs> and then part of it was also trying to figure out basically which uh, subway stations have elevator access. And so it turns out that the High Park station does not have elevator access. And so I had two kids and a stroller and only an escalator to be able to get up to the ground level. So I ended up having, luckily I had a strap for the baby. So I, I strapped my daughter to myself with like the baby carrier. I think it's like an ergo baby or whatever. And then uh, my son was able to stand, just hold my hand and then I had the stroller that I just kind of tilted on a 45 degree angle up the escalator and we made it up to the top. <laughs> and it was funny because on the way back, my son had fallen asleep and he was not waking up. Like, So then I had a buddy who was with me who ended up carrying him downstairs for me. <laughs> Thank God for friends. But yeah, we had a good time in High Park. They have some pretty cool playgrounds there. Kids love doing that, and it was the weather's been really nice too, so it's been a great opportunity to get outside. And then Sunday, of course, was Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mother listeners. Thank you for being the awesome people that you are that give birth to us and uh, make us experience this world. Love you all. And it was also on that Sunday we were celebrating my son's birthday because he's his birthday's only a few days after Mother's Day, so we kind of combined it. And then unfortunately, we ended up only having my wife's family over for the birthday celebration. It was originally supposed to be my parents as well, but they were infected with our COVID. So unfortunately, they had to stay home, but we'll do another separate day for them. And that was pretty much the week. Let's see, real quick, let's do a... Bitcoin update. There's been a major crash happening. We are on block height 735,699. The current price of Bitcoin is $30,859. More than 50% below the all time high of 69,000. So we are at record cheap, cheap prices. <laughs> It's funny to say that because only two years before this, it was like at 4,000. So like, you know, you have to keep things in perspective. Let's see if we look at this from same time in 2020. The So it's May now, right? May of 2020. Today is May 9th. Let's look at May 9th. It was... 8,800. <laughs> so in two years, it's gone from 8,000 to 30,000. But because it had gone all the way up to 69,000, you know, everyone's all scared. Oh, no, it's 50% down. <laughs> you know, you just got to zoom out and take a different perspective, I guess, to, to see what's really going on. But what did I want to talk about regarding Bitcoin today? Well, first of all, there's now a second country following El Salvador that has made Bitcoin legal tender, and that country is the Central African Republic, C-A-R. So this is a country that I didn't know very much about until these news <laughs> came out, and when the news came out, I was like, this, got, this has got to be fake, this isn't real. But after a few days, the news stood, so this is actually turns out to be a real thing. So the Central African Republic is a landlocked country in Central Africa, of course. So if it's landlocked, you know it's a poor country. It took me a long time to understand this, but as an Armenian, a country that is also landlocked, you understand that because you don't have any water, bodies of water as your borders, the number of trade partners you have is severely diminished. So if you'd have bad relations with one of those trade partners, that entire like line of borders is, is kind of compromised. And so 
yeah, it's no surprise that a poor country with bad trade relations could would want to turn to something like Bitcoin. Um, let's see, it says their population is only like just slightly less than 5 million people. So it's not very big. It's less, I think, even than El Salvador, even though El Salvador is a way smaller country in terms of uh, size of like the land mass. And the other issue with this country is, from what I understand, is they do not have a lot of access to internet. Um, I believe like something like 10%. This is just a number I'm pulling out of my ass, to be honest. But like very small percentage of the population, probably as low as 10%, has access to internet. And of course, if you don't have access to internet, you can't really use Bitcoin. So probably this news is not going to have as big of an impact on this country at first as it has on El Salvador. But, you know, this is just the first step in the right direction. And hopefully the people who are in charge of making this call are have the right like mindset and, you know, can get the ball rolling on many fronts, not just this, to improve the future of these people, to give them a hopeful future, a future in which they can accumulate real wealth for the fruits of their labor one type of wealth that can't be stolen from them so yeah it's great news very happy so uh, the other thing i wanted to talk about regarding bitcoin today is i wanted to follow this thread on bitcoin wallets and kind of just go down that rabbit hole a little bit more because it's very interesting it's all like related to math and so if that's something that's interesting to you i think you'll like this so I'm going to follow this thread by Parman, Bitcoin mentor, at Parman underscore the on Twitter. So he says, I dreamt I was explaining something about Bitcoin on Twitter. So let's make it real life. Every single possible Bitcoin wallet, which in brackets here write, is a limitless collection of addresses derived from a private key already exists in the same way that every poss possible number already exists. So that might be confusing. So let me break this down. So a Bitcoin wallet, uh, we can break that down into two parts, the public address and the private key. The public address is the address that everybody else is privy to they can see that address and having access to that address that it's just a number they can send something to that number now that address is derived from a private key so the private key is a secret number is a key and then through that private key you can derive a, a limitless in quotations number of addresses that are public addresses. So with one private key, you can derive multiple, many, almost limitless, like in a functional sense, a limitless, a limitless number of public addresses. And those are your wallets that people send to you. And you have access to them because of the private key. The private key is what allows you to be the one who spends whatever gets sent to that address. Okay, so what he's saying is that all of these Bitcoin public addresses, they already exist in the same way that every number already exists, right? It's not like numbers start existing once you think of them or something like that. All the numbers already exist. It's just what it is. So then the next tweet says, when you make a private key, which is a giant number, you're actually just choosing a number that no one else is going to ever randomly choose. Yeah, that's all you're doing. You make a private key by kind of like pulling a number out of a hat, but it's such a large number that it's like theoretically very unlikely that anyone else would ever randomly choose that same number. Now here it gets a little bit technical. He says, the seed phrase is actually a number. Okay, so the seed phrase is like this set of 12 or sometimes 24 words that someone is given when they create a new wallet with whatever with most wallet providers that you would get for any 
phone, Android or iPhone, they will always, if it's a non-custodial meaning wallet, meaning that you control the funds on that wallet, then they will give you a seed phrase, which is, again, is this set of 12 or 24 words. And encoded in those words is your private key, which is this giant number, as already said. And it's encoded with this protocolized word set in a protocol called BIP39. BIP stands for Bitcoin Improvement Protocol number 39. So through this protocol, they're able to create this seed phrase, which is actually a large number. And then that one number, like a seed, can calculate many other numbers, which are then your public keys, which calculate other numbers, which are addresses. Yeah, so this is a slightly technical part that I don't fully understand. So I guess there's a public key and a private key, but there's also an address. I always thought that the public key and the address were the same thing, but perhaps not. And the interesting thing is, is this wallet is reproducible on any device by that same set of mathematics that it lets you derive like all these things. So when you choose the private number, the private key number, through math, you're able to derive the public key numbers. And then through that same math, you're able to derive all those addresses. And this is not reliant on the actual software provider for that wallet or anything like that. This is only reliable on math itself. He goes on to say, so your Bitcoin wallet is not dependent on any company like Ledger or Tre Trezor. Those are just company names. Rather, it is dependent on mathematics. The wallet you choose was already there since time began in mathematical space all along. Yeah, these numbers already existed this whole time. What makes the wallet significant is the act of locking Bitcoin to any of those addresses, meaning you send Bitcoin to those addresses. Then the already existing wallet takes on a special significance. One of its addresses is now recorded on the blockchain. And in order to move it to another address or spend it, you must make a transaction that provides the public key to that address and a digital signature from a private key that created that public key. Did that make sense? <laughs> Let me see if I can summarize it. So there's this really, really large number that represents your private key. And it is a secret to you and you alone. And with that private key, through some math derivation that I'm unfamiliar with, you're able to derive public keys which is another large number. And then with that public key, you're able to derive an address. And then that address is your wallet, essentially. And somebody can send Bitcoin to that address by making a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, when that Bitcoin is in that address on the blockchain, the only way for somebody to spend that Bitcoin is to provide the public key of that address and a digital signature from a private key that created that public key. Now, of course, they can't actually give the private key itself, right? Because it's a, supposed to be a secret that only you have. So what they can do is they can, I think what you do is like you combine the private and public key together and you can make a signature that everybody else can verify without seeing you, like your private key. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. <laughs> so hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, you can always reach out and ask some specific questions, see where I messed up in explaining it and we can go a little bit deeper reach out to me any way you'd like to. I'm on social media at jmartfit on Twitter and Instagram. Jmart moves on Facebook. You can email me, uh, email at newsletter at jmartfit.com. 
And with that, thank you so much for listening, guys. I love you all. I appreciate you all. Thank you to all of those who reached out about, uh, you know, getting over COVID and everything it really means a lot. And lastly, please share the podcast with somebody else who might be interested in what I'm talking about. That's it, folks. Be active. Stay grateful. Jmart out.